Chapter 8 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It Phases of Memory One of the first things apt to be noticed by the student of memory is the fact that there are several different phases of the manifestation of memory. That is to say, that there are several general classes into which the phenomena of memory may be grouped. And accordingly we find some persons quite highly developed in certain phases of memory and quite deficient in others. If there were but one phase or class of memory, then a person who had developed his memory along any particular line would have, at the same time, developed it equally along all the other lines. But this is far from being the true state of affairs. We find men who are quite proficient in recalling the impression of faces, while they find it very difficult to recall the names of the persons whose faces they remember. Others can remember faces and not names. Others have an excellent recollection of localities, while others are constantly losing themselves. Others remember dates, prices, numbers, and figures generally, while deficient in other forms of recollection. Others remember tales, incidents, anecdotes, etc., while forgetting other things. And so on, each person being apt to possess a memory good in some phases, while deficient in others. The phases of memory may be divided into two general classes, namely, 1. Memory of sense impressions, and 2. Memory of ideas. This classification is somewhat arbitrary, for the reason that sense impressions develop into ideas, and ideas are composed to a considerable extent of sense impressions, but in a general way, the classification serves its purpose which is the grouping together of certain phases of the phenomena of memory. Memory of sense impressions, of course, includes the impressions received from all of the five senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. But when we come down to a practical examination of sense impressions retained in the memory, we find that the majority of such impressions are those obtained through the two respective senses of sight and hearing. The impressions received from the sense of taste, touch, and smell, respectively, are comparatively small, except in the cases of certain experts in special lines, whose occupation consists in acquiring a very delicate sense of taste, smell, or touch, and correspondingly a fine sense of memory along these particular lines. For instance, the wine taster and tea tasters, who are able to distinguish between the various grades of merchandise handled by them, have developed not only very fine senses of taste and smell, but also a remarkable memory of the impressions previously received, the power of discrimination depending as much upon the memory as upon the special sense. In the same way, the skilled surgeon as well as the skilled mechanic acquires a fine sense of touch and a correspondingly highly developed memory of touch impressions. But, as we have said, the greater part of the sense impressions stored away in our memories are those previously received through the sense of sight and hearing, respectively. The majority of sense impressions stored away in the memory have been received more or less involuntarily, that is, with the application of but a slight degree of attention. They are more or less indistinct and hazy, and are recalled with difficulty, the remembrance of them generally coming about without conscious effort, according to the law of association. That is, they come principally when we are thinking about something else upon which we have given thought and attention, and with which they have been associated. There is quite a difference between the remembrance of sense impressions received in this way and those which we record by the bestowal of attention, interest, and concentration. The sense impressions of sight are by far the most numerous in our subconscious storehouse. We are constantly exercising our sense of sight and receiving thousands of different sight impressions every hour. But the majority of these impressions are but faintly recorded upon the memory because we give to them but little attention or interest. But it is astonishing at times when we find that when we recall some important event or incident, we also recall many faint sight impressions of which we did not dream we had any record. To realize the important part played by sight impressions in the phenomena of memory, recall some particular time or event in your life, 
and see how many more things that you saw are remembered compared with the number of things that you heard or tasted or felt or smelled. Second in number, however, are the impressions received through the sense of hearing, and consequently the memory stores away a great number of sound impressions. In some cases, the impressions of sight and sound are joined together, as for instance in the case of words, in which not only the sound but the shape of the letters composing the word, or rather the word shape itself, are stored away together, and consequently are far more readily remembered or recollected than things of which but one sense impression is recorded. Teachers of memory use this fact as a means of helping their students to memorize words by speaking them aloud and then writing them down. Many persons memorize names in this way, the impression of the written word being added to the impression of the sound, thus doubling the record. The more impressions that you can make regarding a thing, the greater are the chances of your easily recollecting it. Likewise, it is very important to attach an impression of a weaker sense to that of a stronger one, in order that the former may be memorized. For instance, if you have a good eye memory and a poor ear memory, it is well to attach your sound impressions to the sight impressions. And if you have a poor eye memory and a good ear memory, it is important to attach your sight impressions to your sound impressions. In this way, you take advantage of the law of association, of which we have told you. Under the subclass of sight impressions are found the smaller divisions of memory known as memory of locality, memory of figures, memory of form, memory of color, and memory of written or printed words. Under the subclass of sound impressions are found the smaller divisions of memory known as memory of spoken words, memory of names, memory of stories, memory of music, etc. We shall pay special attention to these forms of memory in succeeding chapters. The second general class of memory, memory of ideas, includes the memory of facts, events, thoughts, lines of reasoning, etc., and is regarded as higher in the scale than the memory of sense impressions, although not more necessary nor useful to the average person. This form of memory, of course, accompanies the higher lines of intellectual effort and activities, and constitutes a large part of what is known as true education, that is, education which teaches one to think, instead of to merely memorize certain things taught in books or lectures. The well-rounded man, mentally, is he who has developed his memory on all sides, rather than the one who has developed but one special phase of the faculty. It is true that a man's interest and occupation certainly tend to develop his memory according to his daily needs and requirements, but it is well that he should give to the other parts of his memory field some exercise, in order that he may not grow one-sided. As Halleck has said, Many persons think that memory is mainly due to sight, but we have as many different kinds of memory as we have senses. To sight, the watermelon is a long, greenish body, but this is its least important quality. Sight alone gives the poorest idea of the watermelon. We approach the vine where the fruit is growing, and in order to decide whether it is ripe, we tap the rind and judge by the sound. We must remember that a ripe watermelon has a certain resonance. By passing our hands over the melon, we learn that it has certain touch characteristics. We cut it open and learn the qualities of taste and smell. All this knowledge afforded by the different senses must enter into a perfected memory image. Hence we see that many complex processes go to form an idea of a thing. Napoleon was not content with only hearing a name. He wrote it down, and having satisfied his eye memory as well as his ear memory, he threw the paper away. In this book we shall point out the methods and processes calculated to round out the memory of the student. As a rule, his strong phases of memory need but little attention, although even in these a little scientific knowledge will be of use. But in the weaker phases, those phases in which his memory is poor, he should exert a new energy and activity, to the end that these weaker regions of the memory may be cultivated and fertilized, 
and well stored with the seed impressions which will bear a good crop in time. There is no phase, field, or class of memory that is not capable of being highly developed by intelligent application. It requires practice, exercise, and work, but the reward is great. Many a man is handicapped by being deficient in certain phases of memory, while proficient in others. The remedy is in his own hands, and we feel that in this book we have given to each the means whereby he may acquire a good memory along any or all lines. End of chapter 8